the Buddha once said, let an observant person come who is honest and no deceiver, and I'll teach that person the Dhamma. It's interesting that those are the characteristics he looked for in a student. Observant, of course, because you're going to have to observe your mind. After all, the cause of suffering is coming from within the mind. And it's basically things that we're doing again and again and again without realizing that they are causing suffering. So you have to learn how to observe that. And as for the honesty, a lot of those things that we're doing that cause suffering are things we like doing. And unless you're honest, you're not going to be able to give them up. So these are the two qualities that Buddha tries to develop in the path. As he said, when concentration is nurtured by virtue, it has great fruit, great reward. When discernment is nurtured by concentration, it has great fruit, great reward. When the mind is nurtured by discernment, then it's freed from the affluence. We're looking for freedom. We have to build it on virtue, concentration, discernment. We all know this. But it's good to think about why. Why it is the case. Notice the Buddha is not saying that you can't get into concentration without virtue, or that you can't get some discernment without concentration. But the question is, are they going to be reliable? And will they really free the mind? I mean, think about the practice of virtue. You're taking on some rules that may cut across your old behavior, cut across your desires. And you have to be willing to say yes to the rules and no to the desires. There's a passage where the Buddha talks about how you go from listening to the Dharma to actually awakening to the truth. The first step after listening is that you ponder what you've listened to. See how it fits in with other dharma that you've learned, and other beliefs that you may have. Until you decide that, yes, you want to practice the dharma, that's the next stage, desire. Then based on desire, the Buddha says, a willingness, because you're willing to submit to the training. And then you judge. You look at your actions as you are ordinarily acting and ask yourself, okay, where do my actions fit in with the Dharma and where do they not? When you see where they fit in with the Dharma, then you exert yourself. That's the next stage, exertion, to develop those good qualities. As for things that are not good, you have to learn how to say no. This is where it's difficult, because a lot of these things are like things we like doing. That's why an effort is involved, because sometimes we like doing them simply because it's automatic. It's an old habit that we haven't looked at for a long time. When you look at it, you begin to realize that quite easily, okay, I don't want this anymore. In other cases, though, there are habits that you're very familiar with, and you put them over and over and again. And then it's going to be hard to say no. You have to learn how to recreate new habits. But it's through that exertion that you finally awaken to the truth. So honesty is required right from the beginning, when you start looking at your behavior and seeing where it follows and doesn't follow with, in line with the precepts. They're clear-cut, easy to remember. Some people say hard and fast, but clear-cut is a better way of characterizing them, because they're short, easy to memorize. It's when you're faced with difficult situations where it's hard to hold by the precepts. It's good to remember they really are clear-cut and they really are absolute. Of all the Buddhist teachings, only two, what did he say, were categorical, in other words, true across the board. One was the principle that you should abandon unskillful behavior in body, speech, and mind, and develop skillful behavior in body, speech, and mind. 
So there are cases where he would recommend breaking the precepts, no matter what your motivation would be. The other categorical teaching, of course, is the Four Noble Truths. So you keep running up against these fences that the Buddha puts up, and it's your willingness to see that, yes, my old behavior doesn't fit in. I've got to change. But it's not just that. It's a willingness to look at your intentions, because the intentions make all the difference. I got an email recently from a student over in Europe who owns a movie theater, and he had an ant invasion. And he did his best to get the ants out without killing them, but of course he ended up killing a few. But as I told him, it was the intention that counted. You didn't intend to kill them, you don't break the precept. So the precept is not there to make sure that we are absolutely harmless, but it is there to make sure that we get sensitive to our intentions. When you do something, what do you expect? What do you want to attain? Be very clear about that. So that's where the precepts point you. They point you at the mind. There's a Dharma textbook in Thailand that was written back in the beginning of the 20th century. And it defines virtue as holding the precepts in body and speech, just that. And this was brought to John Munn's attention. He said an important element is missing, the mind. Because it's the mind that creates the intentions, and the intentions are what make the difference between what does and doesn't fall under the precepts. In fact, one time he said he himself observed one precept, which was the mind. Keep the mind in good shape. Keep the mind skillful. And you don't have to worry about acting in unskillful ways, because after all, it's the, the mind that gives the orders. And when you realize when an intention comes up against, against the precepts, you've got to do something about it. You can't slough it off, say it's unimportant, or try to excuse it on other other grounds. When you get that kind of honesty and that kind of restraint, then your concentration is concentration you can trust. Because as I said, it's not the case that you cannot get into concentration without virtue. You can. But if your mind is full of denial about the harm you've been doing to your behavior, and you're not used to looking at your intentions clearly. The concentration is going to be full of walls, where you've closed off parts of your mind, closed off parts of your memory to yourself, and created all kinds of stories on those walls that have nothing to do with reality. That's not the kind of concentration that's going to help you see things clearly as they function, which is the function of discernment. So here again, you want to be honest with yourself. You make up your mind to stay with one object, and you've got to maintain that intention. Now you will have had some practice with the precepts in maintaining an intention. You also will have had practice in developing the three qualities that the Buddha said are necessary for the mindfulness that leads to concentration. One, of course, is the quality of mindfulness itself, when you are able to keep things in mind. You have to keep the precept in mind. Alertness, watch your behavior to make sure it actually is in line with the precept, and especially watch your intentions. And then ardency, if you see that there's a temptation to break the precept. You've got to do something about it. You can't just give in. You can't just go with the flow. So those three qualities that are needed for the precepts are the three qualities you bring to the practice of concentration. You keep your object in mind, like the breath. And you're alert to see how the breath is going and whether the mind is sticking with the breath or not. If there are any problems with the breath, you adjust them. You make the breath a good place to be. This is one of the functions of ardency. And if the mind is wandering off, you've got to bring it back. Wander yourself again, bring it back again. While you're with the breath, try to be as sensitive as possible to how the breathing feels. Because it's that sensitivity that's going to develop into discernment. 
This discernment isn't just a matter of imposing the Buddhist concepts on your mind. You have to be sensitive to what you're doing and the results you're getting from what you're doing. And that's nothing you get out of books. It's something you develop by being observant inside. As you get more and more sensitive to the breath, you find that you can get the mind into deeper and deeper stages of concentration. As you see things in the breath that are uncomfortable, you smooth them out. Gaps in your awareness, you try to connect them. And it's normal that we start out with concentration that has gaps. To be with the object for a while, then you slip off, then you come back, you slip off again. Now don't throw away those little moments of concentration. Realize that it's through those moments of concentration, by connecting them, that you're going to get deeper concentration, more solid concentration. So whenever there's a tendency to blur out a little bit, plow right through, stay, stay, stay right here as continually as possible. All the way through the in-breath, all the way through the out, all the way through the spaces in between, and then into the spaces to the next breath and the next. All too often our concentration is like a phrase in music, and then there's a pause, then there's another phrase, then a pause. But here we want to make it like one of those notes that they just hold. And as you try to keep the mind still like this, you're bound to see what comes in to disturb it. This is where the discernment gets based on concentration. It's not just a matter of watching things coming and hoping that they'll go. But it's trying to figure out. You'll notice that some things come into the mind and they have no appeal. They just drift in, drift out. Other things have hooks. You can't say, well, I'll just sit here and watch them come and watch them go. They will come and they will go, for sure. But you've got to get the mind in a state where they don't come anymore. Or if they do come, they have no hooks at all. And that requires that your discernment is not just being with awareness or being with the knowing or just being still. It requires that you think. But it's the kind of thinking that's not far away and discursive. It's thinking about what's going on right now. Where is the appeal? When this thing comes in, why does the mind go for it? And which part of the mind goes? And to what extent was it already prepared to go? This is where the honesty comes in. Because sometimes it seems like the thought comes out of nowhere and you're knocked off by it. But if you're really observant, you begin to notice that even before you go off with the distraction, there will be a little discussion in one corner of the mind that says, okay, the next chance we get, we're going to go for X. And then it pretends like it didn't say anything. And if you're not honest, you'll go along with the pretense. But if you're honest, you begin to realize, okay, there, there are traitors inside in this committee of the mind. You've got to learn how to ferret them out. And the best way of doing that is trying to catch the di distraction more and more quickly until you can see the moments where decisions are being made, even before the thought is clearly a thought. And this is where the discernment comes in, because then you can see where a thought is going to go. It's determined by the intention that oftentimes precedes the thought. Then you can learn how to question that. So there's a lot to question here. As I said yesterday, the Four Noble Truths basically tell us that our minds have been lying to, to, to us, telling us that X is going to cause happiness when X is actually a cause for, 
for suffering and stress. So this is where the being observant comes in and being honest comes in. And this is how we develop those qualities so they get more and more perceptive, more and more true. Because the truth in the Dharma is not the sort of thing you gain or that you reach simply by reading books and understanding them. Remember the steps. You listen to the Dharma, in which case reading the Dharma would count as listening to the Dharma, and then you ponder it. But then you have to have that desire, you have to have the willingness, the, the ability to judge your actions fairly, where they do and they don't fit in with the Dharma, so that you can exert yourself properly to encourage what needs to be encouraged and to discourage what needs to be abandoned. And you begin to recognize that there are some forms of desire that should be encouraged, some forms of desire that should be abandoned. Their Dharma teachings that sound deep and profound, but they're lying to you. You have to watch out for that. But again, you put it to the test of your honesty. If you adopt that teaching, does it really put it into suffering, or does it just put up walls inside? It's only when you're honest that you can see this. But the rewards of honesty are great. As John Lee once said, the truth of the Dharma is something that can be found only by people who are true. Other people can know about the Dharma, but they don't really know the truth. This is one of the ways in which the Dharma is really special.